afternoon. Good afternoon. It's really crashing after that uh, red velvet cake that we ate. The sugar high is over. Now, I will be honest, my title does not really describe what I'm going to talk about. I got my title after the agenda had already been printed, so I'm rolling with it. So don't think I'm going to answer this question for you. But I'm going to tell you that I'm moving towards trying to answer the question. Okay. Um, what what happened was when the call came out, went out for grants looking at local for proposals looking at local laws that did, dealt with the health health issue. I thought of the perfect law. Um, let me skip to the law because that's what's more exciting. In the state of Texas, when I just moved there in 2009, I started seeing these news stories about them passing a law that said it was illegal to to use your cell phone in an active school zone. The school zones are about 10 seconds long, and that's it. So I said, that's the stupidest law I have ever heard of. So when the call went out for us to study a local law and its effect on health, I said, oh, that's just what I want to look at. Is this really going to make a difference? Well, when I got into the law, I saw that there were some different nuances that made it even more interesting. This law was passed as an unfunded mandate. An unfunded mandate means that the state passed the law, but they didn't give the municipalities a dollar to enforce the law. <laughs> and to actually enforce the law, the municipalities have to put up signs in all of the school zones to inform the drivers that if you use your cell phone while driving through this school zone, we can pull you over and fine you up to $200. Mm -hmm. So because it passed as an unfunded mandate, the, local, the actual local municipalities themselves had to come up with the money to put in this infrastructure just to make the law enforceable. So if you don't want to come up with the money, you just don't enforce the law in your jurisdiction as you'll see some municipalities have chosen to do. And it also made it a primary offense now to actually use, to be caught with your cell phone and be pulled over. Now, it's interesting that in Texas, we have what we call independent school districts. So it's even trickier because each of our independent school districts also have their own police. So the question is, who has to pull you over? The city police or the independent school district police? And who gets this money that comes, results from the fine? So when I looked at the literature, I saw that no one else had actually looked at this on a local level. And I told Wendy earlier, I said, I'm doing the one thing I've heard people say all day today, we can't really do it on a local level. Well, I am actually doing, looking at it on a local level, looking, at to see, looking to see how this impacts the cities themselves and if the cost that they are forced to actually put out to enforce this unfunded mandate results in any savings when it comes to the dollar saved from a reduced morbidity and mortality. Now to do this, I had to be a little crafty. This had to be a secondary data analysis. Well, if you know anything, we've heard about laws and regulations and everything today. We also know that this is all public access. This is public information. You just have to request the information. There's no database, and that's why individuals say it's so hard to do it at a local level because we don't have these large data sets that have it put together for all of the cities already. So what I've had to do is actually go to each of the municipalities that I'm studying and request the actual information to help answer my questions. Now the questions that I'm trying to answer are what are the actual costs associated with becoming compliant with the actual law? to each municipality. Also, what are the costs saved through avoiding morbidity and mortality to the municipality that has become compliant? Is there an association between the level of local enforcement and the cost? So you'll see that I'm actually having to create an enforcement score, and I'll talk to you a little bit about how that's being created. And then finally, is there an association between this unfunded mandate uh, banning cell phone use and reduce morbidity and mortality? And just in the last presentation, in the last session, she kind of tipped off why this is important. States follow other states. States are having a very difficult time right now in coming up with the legislation that they're going to enforce when it comes to banning cell phone use. <laughs> it's not very popular with the constituents of the state. So to do an outright ban is something most states are afraid to do. So if you can do something small, like do an unfunded mandate, meaning we don't spend any money, but we create a lot that's going to save the children. 
that seems like a perfect idea for those states who don't know what to do. So that's why we're looking at this to see is it really beneficial for the states. So this is a little different. What I'm looking at is the states, I'm trying to pull over. The states using these, un, we're going to see if states using unfunded mandates to regulate the cell, cell phone use and how it affects municipalities. We're looking at the costs and savings associated with these mandates on the municipalities and hoping to see that what we're going to see, the legislators going to say, we finally have some evidence that this works or doesn't work, and states are going to start creating legislation that's evidence-based so when we duplicate the law, we have something to stand on. Now, to collect this data, it's been two phases. Phase one went rel relatively well. Phase two, not so easy. And because I'm working with different municipalities, each one has their own court reporter that I have to be nice to. Each one has their own records keeper that has her own set of nuances when she comes into the office, when she does it, how I have to do this. Um, they charge different costs associated with just pulling up this information and giving it to me. The phase one collection simply was the cost for becoming compliant. That's the cost of the signs themselves, the cost that it took for manpower to put the signs up. That's all we wanted to see right now, how much are these policies having to spend. This is important. Why? We have reduced budgets in all governments now. Texas has been more fortunate than some states. I came from Illinois, went to Texas. I thought I went from I went to the land of milk and honey when I left Illinois and went to Texas. I really did. Because there was not the same economic climate there within that state. However, when you have a municipality that's having to think about how to appropriate their dollars, and they now have to come up with money to become compliant with the law, dollars have to be shifted. And in the state of Texas, over 60% of the public health is actually coming from local municipalities. So where does that money go? Is this really going to be beneficial? How do they decide whether or not to become compliant? So I had to look at those costs for each of the municipalities. And when it comes to enforcement, um, I have a wonderful consultant that works with me. And he has a unique relationship in that he trains most of the law enforcement in the state of Texas and some of the bordering states. So he has a connection to get me some of the information that I need. So when we're looking at enforcement, we're trying to see exactly how many tickets did you write? Because the law went into effect September, September 1st, 2009. So now we've had two years that this law has been in effect. So we can see, are you really enforcing this law, number one? Also, the law was unique in that each municipality got to set its own fine, up to $200. So if you don't really care about the law, as some municipalities do, you set your fine at $25. So you have an offense, but you really are not, there's really no retribution, there's no punishment for you not being compliant with the law. So I'm looking at the amount of the fine, the number of tickets that you read. I'm also able to look at the amount that it costs to write the ticket. There was a study that was um, put out several years ago, and what they looked at was the average salary of the officers, and they took that and looked at the amount of time, the average amount of time that it took to write a specific ticket. We've actually been able to get from the local law enforcement agencies the amount of time, the average amount of time to write these particular tickets and the average salary of those police officers. Oh, you shot me this guy. So we're gonna be able to see actually how much this is also costing to be to enforce this law for the local municip local municipalities because this, the police departments are not acting. Who's gonna do this? Why do we have to do it? And the last thing we're looking at for enforcement is, when you get a ticket, how do we know that a cell phone was actually a part of this incident? Oftentimes, the officers have to write it in. Some more advanced municipalities have actually put prompts on their tickets or on their citations where the police officers can simply check or mark that a cell phone was related in this offense. But if you don't have that automatic prompt, are you going to be more likely to remember or to forget or to even think about whether or not a cell phone was a part of this incident that occurred that you've written a ticket for? So we're looking at whether or not there's a prompt on the citation. Now when I talk about information, just to tell you some learning pains from working with local municipalities, when I put out my open records request for the citations, 
I said I want a blank citation. And I started getting phone calls. What do you want this for? They, they can't really, they're not really supposed to ask you what they wanted, what you wanted for. What they wanted to make sure of is that I was not going to be out writing my own teacher study. <laughs> so I said, look, you can write a void across it, sample, whatever you want to write across it, that's fine. And if you still don't feel comfortable, I can actually take from you just an official memo or email stating whether or not this prompt is on your citation. And you had to do it to make them feel comfortable. So when you work with these local municipalities, this is something you have to think about. You may have to adjust how you accept your data from them. It's not going to be uniform, but as long as your question is answered, that's all you'll need. Now, when it comes to the number of Incidents of morbidity and mortality, very lucky that the, Texas, the state of Texas collects this for all of their cities. They've been doing it for years, and they will print out a report for you and give it to, give it to you within a few days. So that's how we've collected that information. And to actually assess the cost associated with morbidity and mortality, we're going to be using insurance statistics because they have been very... Um, very interested in how much it costs per crash per incident. So we're able to pull that information and pull it together to assess what's going to be the savings associated with avoided morbidity and mortality. Now, I'm working with 31 municipalities. That makes it a little bit easier when you define the actual local municipalities that you're working with. But we know we have to have that theoretical basis for it. Well, there are only cities that have a million or more residents as of 2009, but also it's interesting to know that these 31 cities make up 45% of the entire population for the state of Texas. So this is going to be a pretty representative sample for the entire state. Now, remember I told you, if you put up the signs, that's when you enforce the law. Well, some cities said, you know what, we're not enforcing it. And when you call them and say, we're not enforcing it, we chose not to do it. And it's interesting that um, Houston is one of the cities that said, we're not doing it. One of our largest cities in the state of Texas said, we're not going to spend that money to put up those signs, so we're not going to enforce this law. So is that really going to be an effective model for future states to follow if maybe your largest municipalities are going to be able to choose whether or not to be compliant with the law? So that's another thing to look at. Now, San Antonio, they have been the slowest to comply with the law, but they are in compliance. But because it's been so slow for them to comply, it's also been very slow for me to get that information from them. But they have promised me it's coming. Now, I'm looking at actually the information from 2009 to 2010. So that's one year of collecting the data, the collecting um, what, whether or not the law has, was enforced and how to what level it was enforced for these municipalities. And then I decided to go ahead and look for 2010 to 2011 just to compare to see Okay, the first year, we're going ho for this. We're all for it. Are we going to maintain this level of enforcement? Are we going to increase it or are we going to drop it? So I'm looking at two years of data. Now, when it comes to analyzing this, you'll see that phase one, because I was just looking at the cost, really all I can do is give you some descriptive information about how much it's costing the different municipalities to actually become compliant. And so, like I said, there were five who chose not to enforce and one who hasn't given me the information. So we have the information for 25 of those municipalities. And the mean is around $30,000 that it's costing these municipalities to be compliant with the law. Now, there, um, it does range all the way up to $144,000 for the municipalities. And this depends upon if you're a larger city, even though you have a population of a million or more, you may have more school districts. You don't get to post one side in the school district. You have to post a sign when you're entering into the school zone, exiting out of the school zone, and on all sides of the school zone. So that means you have more signs, more money to put up the infrastructure, and it's going to cost you more just to, just to be compliance for enforcement. Now, when it came to the citation fee, this is really interesting. Like I said, you say, well, it's up to $200. That's what the law says. Remember we talked about how people are working the law? Well, the law doesn't say that you can't set your own court fines and fees in addition to the amount of the fine. So we have some jurisdictions that, are on, that only have a $25 fine. Well, we have one jurisdiction that has a $500 fine because they've attached and associated their own personal court fees and fines to this. 
And they've added a, an additional level of enforcement because it's a little stricter. You're more, less likely to oh, have your cell phone, to use your cell phone while you're driving through the school zone if you can have up to a $500 fine, even though the sign only says $200. Okay, and you see there's, there's not that much deviation in the amount of time because actually most of the municipalities decided to stick to the $200. What is interesting about this, and this is what I'm thinking about going back and doing because I got it, not because I was asking for it, but just because when you ask, with local municipalities, unlike dealing with states, I encourage you to create a personal relationship with whomever you can. And the reason why is because they give you information that you never knew you would receive. I didn't know when asking about the fines that I was going to find out that from a $200 fine that a municipality would only get $76 and the remaining money would all go back to the state. The state gives nothing for you to become compliant, but they're going to get the majority of the fine back to them. That's interesting. That's something that you need to know. But that wasn't a question that I even knew to ask. But just in talking with the individuals personally, they gave me this additional information. So that you know that even though the municipality is responsible for becoming compliant and paying for it, they don't get to fully benefit from actually enforcing this fine. So some of the things that just to look at, you know, unfunded, man unfunded mandates, they actually allow municipalities to choose. That's not a really good idea for states that are very concerned now with cell phone, uh, the, the accidents associated with cell phones, morbidity, mortality. We're trying to actually, the benefit to states creating laws now is to keep from having a national law. And states don't want a national law regarding banning all cell phone usage at the time. Um, also, when you're trying to determine the impact on state public health initiatives, with deal, you have to think about, um, is the municipality going to be held responsible for becoming compliant? Are they going to actually benefit from this? Or will they actually lose from this? Because I will be honest, I already know the statistics when it comes to the morbidity and mortality. Some of these municipalities have had no cell phone associated crashes that had morbidity and mortality associated with them. So they are spending money but receiving nothing in benefits back from this. Will this be something that municipalities will get behind? Oh, and finally, we're just going to do a correlational analysis, and that's where we're going to come in with that enforcement score.